Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, IUCN Bear Specialist Group North American Bears Expert Team webinar series. Uh, we want to welcome our committee members as well as BSG members, uh, hopefully across the world, to attend today. And uh, um, we just finished our happy um, 54th Earth Day. And yesterday I went and talked to an entire high school of 90 kids about wildlife, maybe mostly carnivores for Earth Day. It was a tough crowd. Um, so hopefully at least we'll be better than that high school crowd I had to speak to. So let's get started. Um, today's presentation is from an invited speaker. Uh, Elise Loggers finished up her, her master's degree at Montana State University and is starting her PhD. Uh, this webinar is based on her master's work and is entitled Evaluating Bear Management Areas in Yellowstone National Park. Two of her co-authors, Carrie Gunther and Mark Haraldson, are North American Bears Expert Team members. Like always, we'll finish uh, the webinar within one hour to respect everybody's time. And don't forget, you can use the chat function to ask questions at any time. Questions will be answered when we open it up for the panel discussion and audience participation. Please mute your microphones and turn off your cameras to keep our bandwidth open. And with that, we want to welcome Elise Loggers. Elise, take it away. Thanks, Chris. So, does that look good? Let me yeah, looks good. Rearrange my screen here. Okay, cool. Um, thanks everybody uh, for coming to hear a bit about not only my master's work, but also how uh, the real results from it have been used in Yellowstone National Park to enhance the bear management program there. So currently, as Chris said, I'm a PhD student at Montana State University, still working on bears in the GYE. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors and collaborators in this, specifically Carrie Gunther with the National Park Service in Yellowstone. This um, project really came from a management need uh, for the park. Uh, Frank Van Manen and Mark Haraldson with the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team, and then, of course, my advisor, Andrea Litt at uh, Montana State University. So before I dive into my work, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that this work uh, was conducted on land currently known as Yellowstone National Park, um, but it has been home and is home to many different peoples. 27 tribes have ties to this area, and I would want to take a moment to acknowledge um, their connection to, as well as well as their stewardship of this land that continues to today. So a bit of a roadmap of where we're going to go today, um, because we're, this uh, talk kind of bridges both the work that I did for my master's as well as additional work um, to enhance a bear management plan in Yellowstone. First, I'll go through the bear management area plan background, as well as some general grizzly bear um, management background in Yellowstone. Then talk about how we assess the efficacy of the current BMA plan. And finally, talk about the framework um, that was used to enhance the BMA plan. So I know this is a very bear-centric audience, and I just want to take a moment to kind of zoom out of that and think about humans, which ultimately are the main reason for um, that wildlife management is necessary. This is a figure from the Outdoor Industry Association showing the number of outdoor recreation participants in millions, that's on the left-hand uh, y-axis, in the United States per year. And what we can see is until about 2015, 2016, there was kind of a constant um, number of people recreating outside. And that number has increased pretty significantly um, since about 2017. So more people are going into the outdoors to recreate. And this also means that more people are spending time in areas that were previously secure for wildlife. So this increased space overlap has some not only potential safety concerns um, for people, but it also has disturbance consequences for wildlife. And one way to both increase safety for humans as well as re reduce disturbance is by restricting areas um, where people can recreate um, from certain areas uh, in a park or a forest or whatever landscape is being managed. And this is what Yellowstone has been doing for grizzly bears uh, since the 1980s. So again, I know that you're all probably very familiar with uh, this figure, um, but 
grizzly bears once ranged as far south as Mexico. Now the uh, most southern grizzly bear uh, range is in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem here in uh, this red circle. And kind of diving into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the estimated range uh, distribution of grizzly bears in the GYE for 2022 is shown here. And it overlaps three different states, Montana to the north, Idaho to the west, and then most of the range is distributed in Wyoming. And what I wanna focus on here is that at the center of this range are three National Park Service units. And that's Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton National Park to the south of Yellowstone, and then the John D. Rockefeller Parkway um, bridges the two. So for those of you who haven't spent time in Yellowstone, I wanna go through kind of just what this looks like. Um, and I know many of you have spent quite a bit of uh, time in the park, but we're all sitting in our virtual offices. Um, so to think about this area and what it looks like on the ground. So Yellowstone National Park is pictured here. It's a satellite image of the park. And there are rugged mountains that kind of ring it to the north, east, and south of the park. So in the first bubble are the Gallatin Mountains, and in the second um, to the right are the Azorcas. And these mountains surround a high central plateau that's kind of characterized as the area where the Yellowstone supervolcano caldera is. But this high plateau in the center of the park um, is made up of many uh, valley complexes. So kind of these large grasslands that are interdispersed in the pretty thick forests. The one pictured here is uh, Pelican Valley and then it's looking south into Yellowstone Lake. And then speaking of Yellowstone Lake, Yellowstone Lake is also at the center of Yellowstone and Yellowstone Lake drains into the Yellowstone River. So, Yellowstone as a national park, it's actually one of the most visited national parks uh, in the US and it sees nearly 5 million visitors per year. But one thing to note about these 5 million people that come to Yellowstone are that 95% of them occur, 95% of their visitation occurs in the front country of the park. So they don't venture into the back country of Yellowstone. And what's interesting about the park is that while people go and see thermal features like Old Faithful pictured here, Yellowstone also holds the most remote place in, in the lower 48 states, and that's the thoroughfare complex here. So it's over 30 miles from any road. It takes a decent amount of effort to get there. And then of course, um, why we're all here today is that uh, grizzly bears exist throughout this entire range. So the greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly bear population was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1975 due to range reduction, habitat loss, as well as mortality. And this kind of plays a key role in um, the management plan that I'm gonna be talking about here shortly. So at the time of their listing, uh, most bears in the population occurred in Yellowstone National Park, yet many of these bears were reliant on human garbage sources, which perhaps isn't what we think about or associate with national parks today. And starting in the 1960s, changes in front country management to a more natural regulation led to abrupt dump closures. And these closures in, led, in turn led to significant human bear conflict and that resulted in um, additional bear mortalities which further reduced the population. However, these changes in front country management did significantly reduce human bear conflict in the front country. And particularly this uh, figure shows the number of injuries uh, per year caused by bears from the 1930s through the early 2000s. So from the 1930s through the 60s, just under um, 50 injuries occurred per year by bears, which to me, that's kind of an astonish astonishing number not living during that time period because now uh, an injury by a bear creates national news, especially occurring in a place like Yellowstone. Um, but we can see after these dump closures and front country management changes, uh, the number of injuries per year uh, drastically reduced. And while these changes did reduce bear inflicted human injuries and property damage in the front country, injuries were still occurring in the back country. And the additional protections for grizzly bears under the Endangered Species Act meant that the National Park Service was also mandated to conserve grizzly bears. So to address the concerns of backcountry recreation, as well as provide area, areas for bears to forage undisturbed, Yellowstone implemented a bear management area plan in 1982. 
And this um, BMA plan restricted human recreation from certain areas of the park that were identified as important to bears. So I'm gonna try and be clear um, of bear management area, but I might say BMA and just know that those are the same things. So this, the objectives of this, of this plan were threefold. Um, first, to minimize bear human interactions that would habituate bears to people. Second, prevent bear displacement from prime food resources. And third, decrease bear caused human injuries. And so um, these areas were selected based on areas that were identified as important for bears. So what does important mean or what was considered in that? So important areas were considered if they had high quality bear foods. Um, so these are things like Yellowstone cutthroat trout, uh, so the tributary streams around Yellowstone Lake, um, as well as white bark pine and ungulate dis distributions, particularly spring ungulate mortality. It also included um, areas that were known to have a high um, cub production. So this included the Gallatin Mountains and the high cub production was in part to help bolster the population. Additionally, areas with high densities of bears were chosen. And finally, conflict in the backcountry was also considered as an area or as a consideration to select an area to be a bear management area. So collectively, about 21% of Yellowstone gained some sort of human access restrictions starting in 1982. So this is a map of Yellowstone. The black lines are the roads in the park. The gray lines are the trails in the park. And the colored polygons are bear management areas. So this is what it looks like. This is the 21% of the park. And human access is restricted in a few different ways in bear management areas. So in purple, um, those VMAs are completely closed to human access, so people cannot enter those areas when they're closed. The tan uh, polygons represent those that have day use access restrictions, so people can go there during the day, but they can't go into the area at night. And then um, the green polygons represent those with on-trail travel only restrictions, so people must stay on a trail or not leave a campsite when they're in those areas. And the timing of these restrictions varies. Some bear management areas are closed for two months and others are closed for seven months. So the Gallatin uh, BMA, which is this one up in the upper left, that bear management area is closed for seven months. And so areas that are far from trails because of snow and other um, road closures, those areas see very few people uh, throughout the year. So, Bear management areas, the plan went into existence in 1982. There were some minor changes to both the extent and the timing um, early in the plan's history in the 80s, but since the mid 80s, not, nothing has really changed um, in terms of either the spatial restrictions or the temporal restrictions in this area or in Yellowstone. So some previous work was has been done on BMAs. Um, in Pelican Bear Management Area, which in that map is highlighted in blue, uh, Carrie Gunther, who is on this call, but is also this person right here um, doing telemetry, or as Mark pointed out, potentially maybe getting struck by some lightning there in the near future. Uh, he observed bears from Pelican Cone looking into Pelican Valley. And this photo on the bottom left is a picture um, from the cone of Pelican Valley. And he observed bears in this area, which is a BMA, to determine how recreational activity influenced bears foraging as well as their activity patterns. And his work showed that bears were closer to cover when people were allowed in the, in the valley and that bears fled to cover during encounters. Additionally, bears did not spend time near backcountry campsites when these areas were occupied. So fast forward about 20 uh, years and Tyler Pullman uh, revisited some questions regarding bear management areas and human um, bear interactions in the backcountry around Yellowstone Lake. So again, those blue bear management areas in the map are on the map are uh, Tyler's study area. And he specifically capitalized on GPS collars, which were fairly new at that time, to ask questions about where uh, changes in where bears spent time in relation to recreation sites, as well as um, whether the area was closed or not. And this work uh, showed that bears did change when they used recreation sites, depending on whether people were active, so whether they were active at the campsite or not, 
as well as if people were allowed in the bear management area or not. So both of these studies provide insights into how bears interact with recreation sites, as well as actual people. Yet in the 40 year period since BMAs were established, uh, Yellowstone has changed pretty greatly. The ecosystem has changed quite a bit and that um, potentially influences whether BMAs still meet their intended objectives. So just to uh, cover some of these ecological changes, a lot of the high quality food resources um, for grizzly bears have changed dramatically since 1982. So this figure I think illust helps illustrate this nicely. It's from Cordini et al. 2023. Um, and I wanna walk through these four um, food resources that bears consume to just talk about how they've changed over this 40 year period. So cutthroat trout, which um, bears consumed uh, kind of early in the non-denning season, they uh, decreased starting in the early 90s due to whirling disease as well as invasive lake trout. And those that population has stayed very low, um, although there's some indications that bears are fishing um, some of the tributary streams for cutthroat again. White bark pine, which are a masting species where you see this big boom bust cycle um, in this green line, they have seen large range reductions um, or large reductions in uh, throughout their range due to mountain pine beetle um, and white pine blister rust. Elk have decreased as well throughout the park and kind of the, on the flip side of this uh, are bison in the park. So bison were used to be at very low, low numbers when BMAs were established, there were about a thousand bison throughout Yellowstone. Now there are over 5,000 bison in the park. So um, the bison population and these other foods have changed quite a bit. One thing or two things that are not in this figure, but I think are important to note, are that um, Yellowstone now has an intact, intact predator guild again with wolves being reintroduced in the mid 1990s, um, as well as cougars recolonizing throughout that same time period. And then of course, fire has been, been a large agent of change uh, throughout Yellowstone. So this is a picture from 1988 when about a third of the park um, burned, but from uh, when BMAs were established in 82 through 2020, about 55% of the park has um, burned to some degree. And then visitation, of course, has all, also changed. So when BMAs were implemented, there are about two and a half million visitors uh, to Yellowstone per year. Now there are about five million visitors per year. Um, visitation has increased quite a bit throughout the park. These big uh, dips in 2020 and 2022 are from the flood that occurred in 2022 as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So changes abound in Yellowstone since BMAs were first implemented and this is really where our work comes in. So today I'm going to talk about two of the objectives um, of our work. First we wanted to understand whether BMAs meet their intended objectives from both a bear and a human um, standpoint and second we assessed whether this plan could be enhanced. So first I'm gonna focus on whether BMAs are still meeting their objectives. And fundamentally, we wanted to explore whether bear is selected for bear management areas, as well as potential factors that may influence their selection to understand if these areas were still important to bears. And then second, we wanted to determine if uh, bear management areas and specifically the restrictions uh, reduced human bear interactions by thinking about how density changes within and outside of bear management areas. Because if there are more bears in an area, there's a greater probability of people and bears encountering one another. So do bear management areas influence where bears spend time? We used uh, GPS telemetry data from long-term monitoring of grizzly bears by the interagency grizzly bear study team to develop uh, step selection functions. And data were collected from 2004 through 2020, and this spanned many different iterations of GPS fixed rates. So we standardized, fix, standardized fixed rates from uh, 90 to 120 minutes. We followed Muff et al. 2020 and used conditional Poisson mixed models with stratum specific intercepts. And I, I wanna to touch on this for a second because I think um, obviously the models are important, um, but what this helped us do was also pretty uh, important. So with this approach, we included random intercepts for individuals as well as random slopes for covariates. 
And this helps to account for variation in individual selection. And it also reduced bias and availability. And this, both of these helped provide a more robust um, population level estimate. Additionally, um, and something I'll talk about a bit in the results, is it allowed us to explore differences in selection among individuals. So not just to have our population estimate, but also see how individuals vary. So we split our analyses by sex and season to account for variation in selection among, sex, or among sexes and seasons. Um, we all know that males and females spend time in different places and use different resources. So we wanted to account for that as well as account for the differences um, across the non-denning period. So to delineate seasons, we uh, followed methods developed by Bath Seattle in 2013. And this clusters um, movement and resource use similarities in those two things um, into seasons. And then finally, we used a two-stage analysis approach um, for modeling. So first, we created ecological models from the environment from environmental variables, and this reflects uh, grizzly bear underlying grizzly bear resource selection. Then we added BMA variables to assess whether, after accounting for un the underlying uh, resource selection, BMAs influenced um, where bears spent time. So for the ecological models, we included variables that are known to influence resource selection elsewhere. So this includes land cover type, which is categorical, um, thinking about both food resources as well as vegetation, distance to forest edge and terrain roughness. We also included distance to anthropogenic, which um, included both developments as well as roads and aspect. And then in Yellowstone, carcasses that occur along roadways, like very near roadways or developments, are moved to specific car carcass redistribution sites. Um, and we wanted to account for kind of this unnatural concentration of um, a very high quality re food resource. So we tested uh, models with combinations of these variables using AICC, and we used the best supported model for this second stage of analysis, which is really where the BMA variables come into play. So in this second stage, we added BMA variables from that previous um, best supported model for each sex season combination. And first, we hypothesize that BMAs are intrinsically important to bears because they can, of the resources that they contain. So we tested whether bears selected for BMAs regardless of human access. So this included on the left side of your screen, you'll see intrinsic BMA. Um, this included bear management areas and non-bear management areas. Second, we hypothesized that bears spend time in areas where it's easier to avoid people. So we tested whether bears selected for BMAs depending on the type of human access. And this had three categories in our analysis. First are restricted areas. So this would be a bear management area that had restrictions actively in place. And the second one is a bear management area that had restrictions at some point during the year, but restrictions were not active. So people could be in those bear management areas. And then third, um, non the rest were non-bear management areas of the third category. And that's that white space that you see on the um, maps. And again, we used AICC to test these hypotheses. So for our results, overall model selection indicated that um, the model with the most support for all sex season combinations included one of the BMA variables, indicating that BMAs did influence where grizzly bears spent time in the park. And I'm going to orient this plot first because we're gonna see a couple of these just um, to be able to interpret uh, what this means. So on the Y axis, we have BMA. Um, so there's one variable here because uh, this is a relative selection strength plot. So on the y-axis, sorry, we have relative selection strength over here. So the x-axis is BMA compared to non-bear management area. So you can think of this as relative selection strength. And um, for example, if the estimate's at two, you can think of that as um, bears are twice as likely to be in a uh, bear management area compared to a non-bear management area. This line at one indicates equal selection. And then of course we have each season mating summer and hyperphagic seasons. And because these seasons were run separately, um, try not to compare relative selection strength uh, between or among seasons. So for females, timing of restrictions did not influence female selection. 
For all seasons, the top model included the intrinsic BMA variable. And although estimates, the estimate indicated that females selected for bear management areas compared to non-BMAs, confidence intervals did overlap one. Because we included random coefficients in the model, we could explore variation in individual selection. So overlaying the random effects, we see that most individuals select four bear management areas. So those are the individuals above the line of one, especially those um, up outside the 95% confidence interval. But we also see that some bears uh, avoid bear management areas and those are under the line at one. And I think this is important and potentially also intuitive for those of us who study bears. They're very individualistic species, they're intelligent, they continually learn throughout their lives and they have different strategies um, to meet their energetic costs or requirements. So for males, BMA status did influence male selection during some seasons. So during the mating season, uh, the BMA intrinsic variable was included in the top model and it indicates some selection for bear management areas, but again, confidence interval overlapped one there. And for the summer and hyperphagic seasons, um, male bears preferred unrestricted bear management areas to both non-BMAs and restricted BMAs. So I think this piece, is, well, this piece is counter to what we had predicted. We had predicted that um, bears would select for restricted areas greater than unrestricted areas. Um, but this was, we found the opposite. And again, we saw um, substantial differences among individuals and in their relative selection strength, with most individuals preferring bear management areas, but again, some avoiding these areas. So to revisit BMA objectives, we found that most bears did select four BMAs, and this was particularly the case for males. But selection by BMAs um, by males indicated that the timing of restrictions and the timing of when they're using these areas may be, may be misaligned. So then moving on to this density piece, we wanted to determine whether BMAs had a greater density of bears than non-bear management areas, as we were interested in this to get at the objectives of reducing human bear in, uh, encounters. So we used the index of grizzly bear density developed by Bjornli et al. in 2014 and extended by Cordini et al. in 2023 to assess differences in grizzly bear density between BMAs and other areas. So this index used long-term capture and telemetry data calculated at 14 by 14 kilometer grid cells, which are the cells that you see on both of these maps, and is also the annual approximate annual home range for female bears in the GYE. And this um, technique hindcasts and forecasts the estimated range extent of individuals. So shown here is 1983 and 2012. And ultimately, this creates a spatial temporal reconstruction of the grizzly bear population. So we used um, an autoregressive mixed effects model to assess how the proportion of bear management area within each grid cell influenced the density of the index of density of bears in that cell. So the autoregressive uh, model indicated that a cell that contained 100% bear management area, so if the cell was covered with BMA, it would have six more bears in it than a cell with no bear management area. And I think that thinking about it in terms of the proportion of cell covered by BMA is um, a little counterintuitive. So maybe a little more intuitive way to think about this or to show this is uh, thinking about the average weighted index of grizzly bear density in, in both bear management areas and non-bear management areas. So across all bear management areas, uh, the index of grizzly bear density is greater or was greater than the non-bear management areas. And that has been the case through time. So back to our objectives. These results indicated that the greater, that there was a greater density of bears in BMA and that the, this probably contributes to a higher probability of human bear encounters in these areas. And ultimately, restrictions likely reduce the potential for human bear encounters in areas where high density, with high densities of bears and where most bears spend time. So results from the first part of our work indicate that there's some success with bear management areas, but 
human in, human injuries inflicted by bears were still occurring in the backcountry. And I know many of you are aware reducing injuries and encounters to zero is virtually impossible. But what was unique about the situation in Yellowstone is that 23% of the injuries and fatalities in the backcountry uh, caused by bears from uh, 1970 through 2017, they all occurred in an area of the park that only made up about 1% of the park's land mass, and that's Hayden Valley. So that's where this photo is um, taken looking towards. Uh, this photo is just south, taken just south of Canyon Village, um, but it's looking south into Hayden Valley, and then Hayden extends out to the west here. And what I want to illustrate with this photo and with the next one as well, as well is that this is a large grassland dotted with tree islands, and bears like to um, day bed in tree islands during the daytime hours. So this again is a photo of Hayden looking west into the valley proper. Um, you can see these tree islands illustrated here. So Hayden Valley was noted as having high densities of bears as well as being a place with important bear foods as early as the 1960s, but it wasn't included in the original BMA plan. And that was for a couple of reasons. First, um, this area was where the Craighead brothers trapped. So that's them trapping here. Uh, Mark would like you guys to also know that that's not how we handled bears in the GYE anymore. Um, but the Craighead's trapped in Hayden Valley and specifically at the Trout Creek dump, which is this second photo on the bottom. And the Trout Creek dump also is indicated by this star here on the map. And Though this area, this dump was closed in 1971, bears were still visiting this area through the early 1980s, um, looking for anthropogenic foods. So for these two reasons, it wasn't included in the original BMA plan. But like I mentioned earlier, many fatalities and injuries occur in this one area. So these black dots are injuries and the red dot, uh, squares are fatalities. And you can see that those are kind of concentrated around that star, which is Trout Creek Dump and that uh, broader area of Hayden Valley. And part of the reason for this is that this area is also kind of the core of the interior bison herd range. And this is also where much of the interior bison herd ruts in August and September. And during rut, uh, some bison die. And what happens when bison die is bears are attracted to these carcasses and it creates um, these high concentration of, or high quality food resources in a concentrated area uh, throughout Hayden Valley. And I didn't mention this, but I meant to. Hayden gives kind of a false sense of security because when you're walking through it, you can see really, you think you can see really far, but it's an undulating landscape. And you can come over a rise and below you is a bison carcass. And this photo is from an interagency grizzly bear study team flight. And on this flight and on this carcass, 23 grizzly bears were seen within a half mile of this carcass. So the carcass is here um, in the center and all of these dots are grizzly bears. And there are 17 bears in this photo. So the question became what to do about Hayden. And Bear experts who had worked in Yellowstone were asked what they would do if Hayden was traded for another bear management area. So with these changes in resources, it was seeming to indicate that Hayden potentially um, could qualify as a BMA, but then to reduce um, the area restricted to human access, which BMA would be traded for Hayden? And one thing that I want to note is that bear experts who worked in Yellowstone or who had worked in Yellowstone would ask what were asked which BMA they would trade for Hayden. And everyone had a very different perspective based on their experience in the park. And I think this piece is important because in any decision-making process, people's values and their experiences um, sometimes heavily influence their decisions. But the National Park Service sought a more data-driven decision-making process. And so to figure out which BMA to trade, they came up with this BMA ranking table. So this BMA ranking table was used to understand how each bear management area listed uh, here, um, as well as Hayden Valley, which is on the top, were um, 
compared to one another. So this included uh, things that were originally, that BMAs were originally created to contain, including uh, the density of bears. And for density, we use the index of grizzly bear density um, that I mentioned earlier, develop, developed by Bjornly, Bjornly et al, 2014. Um, additionally, these next two columns are bears per hour, as well as females with cubs per hour. And these numbers are from, um, or these values were from bear observation flights. So either once or twice a year, the interagency grizzly bear study team um, flies bear management units in the um, demographic monitoring area to count the number of bears um, that are seen from that fixed wing. So the first, the second column is bears per, seen per hour in that bear management unit that the BMA sits within. And then the third is the females with cubs, again, in the bear management unit that the BMA sits within. Uh, the fourth column is a resource selection function um, that I, it's a second order RSF um, that was created for the park for uh, grizzly bears in general. So that's looking at their probability of selection throughout Yellowstone. And then the fifth column uh, represents food resources and specifically the food resources that BMAs were originally established to contain. Um, so white bark pine, cutthroat trout, um, and uh, specifically spring ungulates. So walking through this table, um, Antelope Creek and Washburn had the greatest density of bears with Hayden uh, close behind that. Bears seen per hour on observation flights, Creek, Clear Creek 1 and Clear Creek 2, which run along the east side of the lake, had the highest number of bears seen per hour. But when we flip this to females with cubs per hour, Hayden Valley had the greatest number, as well as the Mary Mountain Trail BMA. And the Mary Mountain Trail BMA is a long skinny BMA that almost abuts Hayden Valley. It's a trail closure. Um, so it makes sense that those two would have similar numbers. For the RSF, um, Hayden again had the highest value for the RSF followed by Nice Creek. And for bear foods, because bison weren't included in this, Hayden had one high quality food resource, whereas some of these other ones had two. But again, food resources have shifted. And then finally, I think you saw where this was going. Uh, Hayden ranked the highest out of um, overall um, against the other bear management areas, um, thinking about all of these or taking into all of the other um, or all of these aspects. So on the flip side of this, the fire hole ranked the lowest um, at, overall and was the lowest in most aspects of the table. So the decision was made to remove the fire hole restrictions and trade it for Hayden Valley. And this um, worked in the terms of restricting human access too, because the fire hole and Hayden are very comparable in the size of area that, that would be restricted. Um, so this wouldn't increase or this wouldn't change public, public, the amount of area the public had for access. And biologically, this also made sense because the ungulate herds that used to use the fire hole in the spring have changed their distribution and many fewer exist there now. So this kind of changes of carcasses from the fire hole to Hayden um, also makes sense biologically. So with this swap of adding Hayden, this also meant that restrictions to Hayden needed to be thought about of what would those restrictions look like. And currently, uh, BMAs in the park have restrictions for on-trail travel, time of day, as well as complete closures. So in 2020, Carrie Gunther and Mark Haroldson assessed how restrictions to Hayden Valley may have prevented previous bear-inflicted human injuries or fatalities. And they found that restricting access to the valley during the bison rut may have reduced the most number of injuries. And um, I didn't point this out, but this is Hayden here. This is what this polygon in is. And this green line that runs through it is the only trail in that area. And additionally, many of the injuries um, that, and fatalities that have occurred in Hayden have occurred off trail. So results from uh, Carrie and Mark's paper indicated that no off trail travel restrictions would have additionally further reduced human injuries in Hayden. So this ultimately led to changing the restrictions in Hayden to on-trail travel only from July 15th through September 15th, which coincides with when the bison rut occurs in this valley. 
So this framework and enhancement of the bear management area plan is a unique example of affecting change to a long-standing management plan. And Yellowstone may also be a unique case where implementing closures to human access is possible, but our work demonstrates that these areas have likely reduced human bear encounters. And I wanna end with a couple of slides thinking back to recreation um, at either the GYE scale, which this depicts, or um, the North America or world scale. So this is a greater Yellowstone ecosystem and what this map depicts is activity and data from recreation. So this is from Straw, which is a, um, an online tool that over 100 million people use to track their sport activities. So this isn't motorized recreation, this is human powered recreation occurring um, in this case throughout the GYE. So here we have Yellowstone Lake, Bozeman is, is up here and Jackson is down here. And if we zoom out to North America, we see that recreation even throughout the United States and into much of Canada is also seemingly pervasive, leaving wildlife with fewer options of areas to not encounter people. And with current trends and recreation pressures, it's increasingly important to balance recreation access as well as needs of species and particularly those sensitive to human activities. An implementation of spatial temporal restrictions like bear management areas can provide an effective tool to achieve these objectives. So with that, I'd like to thank um, many, all of the funders in this project, which were several, as well as acknowledge the biology, biologists, technicians, and managers who've worked in the GYE over 40 plus years, um, especially those who have collected data um, that were contributed to this project. And then finally, a uh, special thanks to the Bear Management Office in Yellowstone, as well as the uh, interagency grizzly bear study team. So with that, I'll end my slideshow. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll take any questions. Oh, anybody have any questions? Please speak up. Very good, Elise, very interesting presentation. Thanks. Kate? Um, I was wondering if uh, you had thought about exploring um, the boundaries of the BMAs and whether they are um, kind of uh, as efficiently drawn and, and consistent within them, um, whether, whether you took a look at that. Yeah, um, I think I would say we looked at it in the RSF um, overlaying the uh, bear management areas and where bears select for. So we looked at it in that term, in terms of that, um, but not specifically looking at if we were to redraw all of the BMAs. And um, Mark and Carrie might be able to chime in more here. Um, but I think also part of that is the feasibility of changing the entire system or not and questions associated with that. Yeah, this is Carrie. Uh, that is one thing we've thought about, and that might be a project for a future grad student is to look at the boundaries and see if they're in the best places possible for the most efficient uh, for bears. Elise, I have a question, and it it's more to do with sort of how you look at the problem. You know, you were you were um, looking at selection by some bears. And um, I was thinking, well, is that, I mean, we're interested in the behavior of the bears and trying to uh, control human behavior to, to minimize risk, risk to people, which is equals risk to bears. Um, and, and you have some bears, you said, well, that um, they don't all select for the BMAs. In my mind, that's what you would expect because the whole park is occupied by bears and so, and what you want is those bears that don't live in the BMAs, you kind of want them to become more habituated to people. You, they have to coexist more strongly than the other ones that have a home range in a BMA. And I guess a male's home ranges are all bigger than a BMA anyway, eh? like they move in and out of them. But I was just trying to think about that angle of, okay, what are we managing for? Are we managing for density or 
are we managing for risk at certain sites? You know what I mean? And in the end, I think you answered that by showing us you made a decision about that one BMA and it was largely about a site level risk. And and yes, there's higher density there because there's so many buys it, I guess. But anyway, I don't think I've asked a very clear question at least, but it's it's more that that thought process that that we go through and are we at, you know, are we at the right angle here? Or wait, are we? I don't know if you have a comment about that. Yeah, I guess my comment on it is another thing that we're working on uh, right now is looking at more fine scale selection and really thinking about how bears differ in uh, their selection and movement near recreation sites. So are they moving faster? Are they selecting for these areas? And how does that potentially differ among individuals as well as among these different um, either bear management restrictions and non-BMA restrictions to kind of get at like, how are bears and people interacting um, in the backcountry and how are bears navigating that? So is that what about, could you make a layer of risk? You know, like we, you showed us those dots where the accidents have happened and it seems like those are the things that you're actually trying to reduce. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway. But I think on the flip side of that and something that I've been thinking a lot about is uh, the human component in like, when injuries occur or when fatalities occur and how to disentangle that from what bears are doing. Mm -hmm. Bring the people. Yeah. Yeah. Dave. Thanks. Yeah. First, Elise, that was an excellent study and you presented it very clearly. Thank you. Um, I, and I think this is going to be a good webinar for other people in the bear specialist group to look at, you know, elsewhere around the world about, these kind of management areas or protected areas. The thing that was um, striking to me is that you had to swap out two areas. Was that in the original management plan that this is fixed and you can't have any more through time and that any addition you have to swap something? I'll let Carrie take this one because I can see him smiling over there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, originally, um... Myself and my supervisor, PJ White, we tried to slip in Hayden as another BMA without giving up one. Um, but there's a lot of park service management that really looks after uh, the recreational aspects of a national park and not uh, limiting those opportunities too much. And so um, in the end, we had to, I, I, was, I was told that I needed to swap one out in order to uh, Go through with Hayden, and so, um, yeah, we maintained about twenty-one percent of the park. Uh, we took an area where there's the highest density of bears, and we have a lot of injuries. And then, as Elise mentioned, we dropped an area where we just don't get the concentrations of bison or elk anymore, and so that area is uh, not nearly as important to bears. Uh, so, it, national parks, it's you can't always manage straight on straight biology. You have to make uh, political compromises. And that's what we did. Right. And, and, and likewise, as sort of a follow up to Kate's question, was there any talk about changing the restrictions rather than swapping out, like making a place that was very restrictive, less restrictive? You know what I mean? Because there were different restrictions and the different BMAs. Yeah. Um, and, and this effort with Hayden Valley is probably the first like, as Elise mentioned, you know, it had been 40 years since we really made any changes. So we're mm -hmm. starting here uh, with a rather big one, but we may um, do a lot more tweaking uh, in the next few years. Just the, the way animals are using landscape has changed quite a bit and the uh, visitation has changed quite a bit. So uh, we'll probably tweak the whole system uh, slowly over time. I, I don't want to give up too much or ask for too much right away or I'll get shut down. Sure. Thanks, Gary. We were... I'll mention, you know, there was a concession to try to maintain a certain percentage of the park in bear management areas. And that was one of the considerations. Because initially I was afraid we might lose more than <laughs> we gained, you know. Uh, Russ, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I, I echo what Dave said about this being good study and good presentation. I'm actually going to send it to some people to say this is how you show information and keep people on track. Uh, my question also, uh, 
kind of follows up a little bit on, on what other people have asked. And that is that you're showing how to adapt management given these various constraints. And one thing that people are starting to think about now in regards to conservation in, in the IUCN framework is um, kind of looking against what is possible. Like, here's where we are, here's where things were, what is the possible and how close are you to reaching that? Um, given how bear numbers have changed, human numbers in recreation have changed, and the foods have changed. Has anyone, or are you thinking about looking to see, okay, we're at 85% of what we could do. It doesn't mean politically that you would ever get there, but have you done a thought of experiment like that? I guess I have, and so I took a class earlier this year, a structured decision-making class, and we brought this, I brought this problem to the class and it was really interesting thinking about it, especially with people who don't think about Yellowstone, don't think about bears, think about resource management to some degree, um, just the breadth of possibilities and um, kind of using a more, maybe, while we did use, I guess, a structured decision-making approach to some degree with the BMA ranking table, but thinking about like all of the other options, um, that was very eye-opening to me. And so I think have I done a thought experiment on it? Yes. Um, have we had formal conversations about it? Maybe less so, but I don't know if Mark or Carrie, you guys have anything to can add there? Yeah, I think um, with delisting potentially looming on the horizon, we we think we're probably going to get a lot of kickback on bear management areas. Uh, you know, once bears are delisted, do bears still need this? So. Um, we're taking a very slow and cautious approach because we don't want to lose the whole thing. So follow-up question to what you just said, Gary, if um, if people look at these BMUs, you know, um, and Park Service looks at these BMUs, do they look at them as a benefit to bears or a benefit to visitors? Well, both. Uh, so one of the objectives was to reduce displacement of bears from high quality food sources and to reduce habituation. And hu habituation isn't necessarily bad or good. It's just what happens when you have 5 million people visiting an area with grizzly bears. Um, but habituation is our biggest management challenge. It really takes the majority of, of uh, my program's budget and staff time. Um, and so bear management areas by keeping Reducing recreational levels, it reduces habituation, um, reduces encounters, which thus reduces conflicts and encounters and bear inflicted human injuries. Um, and in this Hayden Valley example, by opening up the fire hall, that was an area, um, it's pretty popular with spring visitors. Um, and so it was a win-win, I think, for bears and people because it opened up some trails and backcountry campsites to the public in an area where we don't see much bear activity. And then we're taking an area where we see a lot of bear activity and uh, restricting visitor use. So it, it was a win-win, which again, that made it easier for me to um, justify it to upper park management because I was giving something to visitors, but uh, also giving something of great value to bears. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, I have another one, a quick one, and at least you did a tremendous job in monitoring what the bears were doing and what was happening on the landscape and how the bears thought about bear management units. Has anybody ever um, surveyed the public and the users of Yellowstone Park as to whether they think the bear management, you, you know, areas where they can go and can't go is acceptable? Is, what do people think? I'm just going to throw in something here before Carrie gives a probably better answer. But when the public announcement went out for bear management areas, looking at social media comments, there were, I saw one negative comment after out of all of this. And to me, that was a huge win across Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, like for the public to say, yeah, th this is great. And I think this should be occurring. And only having one person 
not supporting that. I thought that was I thought that was just an interesting anecdotal thing to note. Yeah, and when in 1982 when we started these, it was very controversial and we got a lot of kickback, especially from commercial outfitters. I was thinking we were going to get the same, and I almost I was kind of hesitant to do this Hayden Valley Bear Management Area because I thought it was going to draw attention back to the whole program and we might lose it. But um, like Elise said, I only saw one negative comment and we, we did a press release and everything and uh, there was very little uh, comments in general. I think most people just thought we were doing good things for bears. Um, and then also in answer to your question, Chris, it's a lot easier to study bears in a national park than it is to study people. If you're gonna ask visitors questions, we have to go through the federal register and get all the questions pre-approved uh, it's, it's a lot easier to study the bears than, than to ask visitors questions. You could capture a few people and put collars on them and then release them somewhere. So, D Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, Elise, was this originally this idea of swapping out or finding a, a better area? Was that part of your original study design for your masters or was that just sort of something that came along after you did the analysis and said hey we can actually find a better one uh it was not part of the original uh my master it was actually not part of my master's my master's is the first portion and another chapter that i didn't present today but i will at iba for those of you who are going to iba and then after that kind of between my master's and phd was when we started thinking or carrie was thinking about hayden and so we started looking into um that BMA ranking table. It's great. It's such a nice progression of kind of thinking. Like, let's let let's let's start analyzing how our BMAs are, and then you say, "Hey, wait, we can actually find a better one." It's it's real. It's really neat in terms of management and conservation. It's a good story. Yeah, yeah it is a good story, and it shows the the use of bear data with the use of human encounter data too. To you know, use both of those together to say that we can do this better, and then getting it done. And I'm so great that you didn't get any kickback in in actually implementing that. So, good thing all the way around. Uh, research leads to good things for bears. So, congratulations to all of you, um, you Elise, and certainly Carrie as well, and all the work that you you both have done. So, great, great stuff. Thanks, yeah, thank, thanks for presenting here. This is a great addition to the webinar series. Yeah, and we're going to add more of these where we have um, uh, folks that we work with, all of us. Uh, we're going to bring them in like you, Elise, and give us uh, webinars to the NABIT team because this was really great benefit to the program. And I think we all learned a lot today. So it was great. Appreciate it very much. And uh, congratulations on an excellent presentation. I look forward to seeing your presentation there in Edmonton. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Yep. So with, with that, we're at the end of our hour. We're right on time. And uh, we want to thank everybody for attending today. Hopefully it was useful to you. And um, we'll see you next time.